Okay, YouTubers, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the presentation. And today what we want to discuss, we want to look at the body count from Fukushima. We're inevitably, unavoidably, we're going to have to discuss body count fatalities from the radioactive plume and fallout. And to do that, let's take a step back first and look at Chernobyl. And I will direct you, would direct you to the famous study which is on file at the annals of the New York Academy of Sciences. And it's titled Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment. Again, this is a must read. A must read if you want to know the truth about nuclear power. Even if you just go in and, and read just the introduction, uh, it's very enlightening. And it goes into detail about how difficult a time they had actually getting any information because there's a cover-up with Russian authorities, uh, just like there was with American authorities with Fukushima. Again, this report is authored by Alexei Yablokov, Vasily Nesterenko, and Alexei Nesterenko. Consulting editor, Jeanette D. Sherman. Some of you may be familiar with her, and we'll look at one of her studies coming up here in just a minute. Okay, I would direct you to page 210 in this particular study of Chernobyl, and I will read you to the section I have boxed in red, which is pretty much cuts to the chase, and we're going to talk about deaths from Chernobyl, and I would remind you it's not just deaths. We have deformations and genetic um, abnormalities that are passed down from generation to generation. So it's it's a lingering effect, and it's not just uh, the pure body count. There's other mal effects as well we need to uh, consider. Quote, thus the overall mortality for the period from April 1986 to the end of 2004 from the Chernobyl catastrophe was estimated at 985,000 additional deaths. This estimate of the number of additional deaths is similar to those of Goffman and Bertel. That's two other studies that have similar um, findings. A projection for a much longer period for many future generations is very difficult. Some counter-directed aspects of such prognosis are as follows, and it goes on to give details, but what we want to concentrate on here, and this is a conservative estimate. Again, they, it's hard to get numbers, hard to get cooperation with authorities, but this particular study found an approximate 985,000 additional deaths, and, and keep in mind that's from the period from 86 to 2004. Okay, now we're going to take a look at health effects from Chernobyl. Dr. Ian Fairley, Consultant on Radiation in the Environment, London, United Kingdom. Chernobyl's radioactive contamination, greater than 37 kilobecquerels per meter squared, is responsible for 3.8 to 4.4% of overall mortality in areas of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and other European countries with contamination levels around 19 kilobecquerels per meter squared. The mortality is about 0.3 to 0.7% reasonable extrapolation for additional mortality in the heavily contaminated territories of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus brings the estimated death toll to about 900,000 for the first 15 years after Chernobyl. Chernobyl conclusions. Terrible consequences. Well, that's right. The fatalities and the uh, deformations and so on and so forth. Health effects still occurring. It just doesn't happen uh, for a year and then stop. It's ongoing. We're going to look at some graphs in a minute that will absolutely shock you. Different health effects appearing. I guess it's not just deformations and, and fatalities. There's a number of other uh, adverse heart conditions, etc., that come from it as well. Need more research and funding? You know, Obama wants CDC to do a gun violence study, but he won't do a post Fukushima cancer study or thyroid study whatsoever. And for me, that's really um, a key red flag for me that they know all about this, but don't want to look into it and show the numbers. Need to question denials by many governments. You know, there's a cover up with Russia as well. So, what we find in these massive uh, nuclear catastrophes, there's always a cover up. There's evidence in the Freedom of Information Act documents pertaining to Fukushima by the NRC that show that the DOE oversaw the information control of Three Mile Island, which was very well covered up as well. Three strikes and you're out, folks. Three Mile, Chernobyl, and now Fukushima. Chernobyl observed health effects thyroid cancers, leukemias, other solid cancers, non-cancer effects, many satellite mutations, mental and psychosocial. Okay, this next clip is a graph we wanted to look at here, thyroid cancer incidents, Belarus and Ukraine. And these are usually done in per 100,000 
and if you look, regardless of what the left um, numbers mean on this particular one, and I'm pretty sure it's per 100,000, as all the others are as well, though it doesn't show that in this clip. It's safe to assume that. Either way, if you look at the shape of the graph, that's what we want to note. And in particular, what's important is to note the first couple years, four to five years afterwards, it's not that big a bump up and an increase. And then when you begin to look around 89, um, 90 and going up from there it begins to spike especially in Blara so just look at that and note that it takes many years afterwards for the effects to really kick in that's what they don't want you to know we have yet to really feel the full effect and again this other one is done in per 100,000 on that left margin thyroid cancer incidents incidents per 100,000 in Belarus what is so critical to, to note in this particular graph is that it's many years later before the spikes begin to occur. So keep in mind we're only what two and a half years in from Fukushima, not even three years yet. We have yet to reach the five year mark where we're really going to begin to see the increase in the cancers and leukemia and what have you. That's the most critical thing to draw from this particular graph. Okay, and that concludes the Chernobyl part of this lecture. Now let's take a quick glance at the Joseph Mangano and Jeanette Sherman study which followed Fukushima uh, very closely. It didn't take long for them to get this study out and this was where they looked at the 14 weeks after Fukushima and then the prior 14 weeks and they went and crunched the numbers under the fatality studies and they said hey if you look prior to and then after there's been a jump up percentage wise in the number of people dying could this be related to Fukushima so their study is titled an unexpected mortality increase in the United States follows arrival of the radioactive plume from Fukushima is there a correlation very quickly I would mention there's another study having to do with birds that the scientists did this study during Chernobyl and uh, following, following Chernobyl and following post Fukushima as well and the effect with the birds was the same was absolutely the same and so we look at these fatality index studies and when it's happening with the birds as well as the humans that begins to narrow down the possibilities as well as I would point people to Fairwind's Associates I'm not a big fan of Arnie Gundershill but if you go to Fairwind Associates they match up the Fukushima fingerprint to prove that the radiation from Fukushima that is the radiation we've been hit with not Cold War era bomb testing or anything other than that okay let me just read you the uh, section from the front page of this study it says the multiple nuclear meltdowns at the Fukushima plants beginning on March 11 2011 are releasing large amounts of airborne radioactivity that has spread throughout Japan and to other nations Thus, studies of contamination and health hazards are merited. In the United States, Fukushima fallout arrived just six days after the earthquake, tsunami, and meltdowns. Some samples of radioactivity in precipitation, air, water, and milk taken by the U.S. government showed levels hundreds of times above normal. However, the small number of samples prohibits any credible analysis of temporal trends and spatial comparisons, time and space comparisons. U.S. health officials report weekly deaths by age in 122 cities, about 25 to 35 percent of the national total. Deaths rose 4.46 percent from 2010 to 2011 in the 14 weeks after the arrival of Japanese fallout, compared with a 2.34 percent increase in the prior 14 weeks. The number of infant deaths after Fukushima rose 1.8 percent compared with a previous 8.37% decrease. Projecting these figures for the entire United States yields 13,983 total deaths and 822 infant deaths in excess of the expected. These preliminary data need to be followed up, especially in the light of similar preliminary U.S. mortality findings for the four months after Chernobyl fallout arrived in 1986, which approximated final figures. And again, that's in that Chernobyl study we have already just talked about. If you look in there, they also go into that as well. And again, that's the methodology and the results are congruent with the studies coming from Chernobyl and the studies being done uh, post Fukushima. It's very critical to note that it's not just one or the other it's both of them and you match it with the bird study being done simultaneously and we really got a lock on this folks okay next clip we're looking at the latest study from Joseph Mangano and Jeanette Sherman very much respected scientists 
and this is one is titled Elevated Airborne Beta Levels in Pacific West Coast U.S. States and Trends in Hypothyroidism Among Newborns After the Fukushima Nuclear Meltdown. In this particular study, they're looking at the thyroid of the uh, newborns after the post-Fukushima nuclear meltdowns. And here's what the abstract reads. Quote, various reports indicate that the incidence of congenital hypothyroidism is increasing in developed nations and that improved detection and more inclusive criteria for the disease do not explain this trend entirely. One risk factor documented in numerous studies is exposure to radioactive iodine found in nuclear weapons test fallout and nuclear reactor emissions. Large amounts of fallout disseminated worldwide from the meltdowns in four reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi plant in Japan beginning March 11, 2011, included radioiodine isotopes. Just days after the meltdowns, I-131 concentrations in U.S. precipitation was measured up to 211 times above normal. Highest levels of I-131 and airborne gross beta were documented in the five U.S. states on the Pacific Ocean. The number of congenital hypothyroid cases in these five states from March 17 to December 31, 2011 was 16% greater than for the same period in 2010, compared to a 3% decline in 36 other U.S. states. The greatest divergence in these two groups, plus 28%, occurred in the period March 17 to June 30. Further analysis in the U.S. and in other nations is needed to better understand any association between iodine exposure from Fukushima Daiichi and congenital hypothyroidism risk. So there you go, folks. Another study which is showing the effects in uh, newborns in the thyroid gland. Now, and finally, we want to look at the Bobby 1 Fukushima death toll study, which is the most comprehensive one, but again, he says in here, in some places he can't get complete data and he's unable to extrapolate when he does not have data, obviously, and so this would be still, I would remind you, a very conservative, these numbers are conservative estimates. And better to err on the side and be conservative than to you know, go really high on numbers and look like a fool. Fukushima death toll in the U.S. surpasses 21,000. The nuclear power plant disaster at Fukushima following the great Tohoku earthquake and tsunami in Japan has led to widespread radioactive contamination of Japan's air, water, soil, and food and a large area of Japan has been evacuated. The radionuclides that have been released into the atmosphere have spread across the northern hemisphere due to prevailing westerly winds at mid and upper levels. In a previous article, the author analyzed the elevated levels of beta radiation in the United States following the disaster. In this study, the mortality in the U.S. resulting from this contamination is investigated. As of July 9, 2011, the total number of deaths in the U.S. from Fukushima radioactive contamination is estimated to be 21,385. Again, that's a conservative estimate. Okay, let's talk about the methods. How does Bobby One do this? I told you he's a top-notch investigator, researcher, and number cruncher, and here's what he does. Methods. Data were collected from the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report, which is published online from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Weekly data from 115 cities was obtained for weeks 11 to 27 in year 2011, and for the same numbered weeks in 2010. The idea is very simple. Compare the numbers of deaths in those 17 weeks in 2011 with the same 17 weeks in 2010. Any excess increase of deaths were considered to be due to Fukushima. It says corrected for population growth only. The CDC divides the nation into nine surveillance regions. In each of these regions, the increase in mortality was computed. Using the 2009 death rate, the 2010 census data and the estimated annual growth in population from 2010 to 2011, the increases were scaled for the population of each region and counts of total deaths were obtained. Only regions with a significant increase in deaths were counted. In order to obtain the statistical results, the test PTMP, permutation tests for match pairs, was employed. This routine is available from the software package Blossom. In order to obtain the aggregated statistical results for each region, and for all regions, the data for each city were standardized to zero mean and unit variance beforehand. In obtaining rates and death counts, missing data was replaced by the average for the time period for the corresponding year. For the statistical analysis, both observations were dropped if either or both of the paired data were missing, 
Some cities were dropped, such as Phoenix, Arizona, and St. Louis, Missouri, due to too many missing data and when partial counts for that city were indicated. And so that's excellent work. If he doesn't have all the information, you don't even want to mess with that. Again, these would be conservative numbers because if the paired data were missing on either side, they just dropped it and went on to the next one. And if you look at the table below, it gives you some regions and gives you the mortality increase in a percentage and the total deaths in that particular region and for all five regions. Again, I'll link to all these studies and I implore you to please look into them and read them in their entirety. And then call your congressman or write your congressman. This is very serious. Post Fukushima excess deaths in U.S. updated for October 8. This is back in 2011 now. This is in 2011. Again, it's ongoing. We're still having emissions and I'm told it's China syndrome. The latest week, 40 mortality statistics, week 40 mortality statistics through October 8, issued by the CDC and Prevention, now indicate that the number of excess deaths in the U.S. since the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster now stands at 39,925. And you look, can look at each region and see what his uh, predictions are in those particular regions. The East South Central region, Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, was found to have a significant mortality increase in week 39, and these deaths are now being counted. In the past two week period, more excess deaths have occurred east of the Mississippi River than west of it. Infant mortality increase is now significant in the Mountain region, plus 8.8%, and the New England region, plus 18.6%. The east-north-central region exhibited moderate increases in weeks 36 and 38, plus 5.2% and 9.6% respectively. This area, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, currently has the fastest increasing death rate in the U.S. The following table lists U.S. cities with double-digit percentage increases in mortality since March 13. You can have a look at that and see if your city is there. If it's close to your city and look at New Haven, Connecticut, 34.0%. It's pretty incredible. And for Rad Chicken, you guys in Michigan, well, there you are right there. I mean, you're looking at the the actual death rate, the study of the mortality index, and you can see, and there's no wonder you have stra mutated strawberries and mutated dandelions, right? Here's, here's evidence to back that up. The following table breaks down total excess, excess deaths by month. And you can have a look at that again. This is 2011, just post Fukushima. And you can see how by May, we're really getting bombarded. Again, these are very conservative estimates. Keep that in mind. The next table, increase in deaths by region and age group. And you can see how it affects different age groups and in what particular region got hit the worst. Okay, this next graph, percentage increase in deaths by week. So your left column is a percentage, number of percentage, it can be below. And when people, the, the death rate is slowing and we're, we're living longer and doing much better. And then you can look as it goes up and this particular one, West, North, Central, was really getting hit around between the months of the before, just before uh, June, 5, 7, 5, 14, May, March, April, May, June, May 5, 7 through the 14th, they're really getting bombarded there. Critical to see how it doesn't always hit right away. Sometimes, you know, as the plume and the emanations come and go and become more concentrated or kind of dwindle, you'll have a rise and fall in the, you know, radioactivity downwind from that particular source. Okay, here's a big one, folks, and let's look at this one and and this is where I'm I'm judging a lot of my estimates. Again, I always say it's an estimate. I always tell people it's conservative, very conservative. Again, in Chernobyl, those are conservative estimates. Kevin Blanche will tell you that too. And he's really much more of an expert on, on a lot of these subjects than I am. Certainly Chernobyl and a whole bunch of other stuff, him and Shazam. So if you have a, a really technical question, I'd probably refer you to either of those guys or Miss Milky. Uh, Kevin Blanche really is a, pretty much an expert as far as I'm concerned. If you want to talk about Chernobyl, yeah, I would discuss it with him. His numbers are much higher than these conservative numbers we've looked at in this particular uh, lecture I'm giving you now. Okay, let's look at the future. If the current increase in the mortality rate continues at its current pace, well over one million deaths will occur by the year 2031. Table 5 summarizes the cumulative deaths in the U.S. for selected time periods. Table 5, cumulative deaths in the U.S. for future years assuming current death rate. Year 2012, 65,592. Year 2016, 327,960. Year 2021, 655,920. Year 2031, 
1,311,840. And folks, I remind you again, these are estimates, they're conservative, and these aren't just numbers. These are human beings, human beings that deserve to live out their whole life and to live a happy life and not one sick with cancer or whatever illness as a result of a nuclear meltdown. Of course, the health effects of radiation exposure usually do not appear until 5 to 20 years after the exposure, and the death rate may increase dramatically in coming years. Figure 3 displays the incidence of thyroid cancer per year in Belarus following the Chernobyl disaster. And we, we looked at that one in the other um, study, but here it is again. And this is, again, this is so critical that you understand to everyone listening to this video. I don't care if you're law enforcement or FBI or you're a judge or a cop on the street or a school teacher or a construction worker or a janitor, or if you study birds for a living, or if you're an anti-nuke activist, this stuff rains upon down upon each and every one of us. And it does not discriminate. We are all in the same boat. We have common ground. We should all be unifying against a common threat folks this is really a very serious common threat to us all okay people are dying hundreds of thousands will die from this so we've got to do something about it and look at this chart 2001 it's spiking in adolescence look at that that's amazing folks because 1986 87 there's a little spike in adolescence 88 not much 89 not much 90 starting to go up 91 going up 92 going up they're all going up and then you really begin to see the spike 96 97 10 years later 10 years later folks that's what's most worrisome okay so the next clip summarizing the march deposition of beta particles we have the following states ranked in decreasing order of dry deposition this would be for march 2011 post fukushima number one arizona Two, Utah. Three, California. Four, Hawaii. Five, Florida. Don't think you're getting out of it just because you're on the East Coast. This was known with Chernobyl when Oregon had rainwater warnings, and they also did a fatality index study which had similar results. The following states are estimated to have the highest amount of March wet deposition. That means it's coming down in the rain. California, Hawaii, Florida, Washington, and Oregon And number five. The areas with higher amounts of dry deposition of beta particles are likely to suffer relatively higher amounts of contamination in topsoil and vegetation. Radioactive particles would tend to collect on the surfaces of green leafy vegetables. Areas with high amounts of wet deposition would have higher amounts of beta particles deposited from rain and especially snow. This would find its way into groundwater and drinking water supplies for cities. The contamination levels are likely to be greater in areas with high elevations. Okay, and finally, this is not from the Bobby One study, but I thought it relevant and important to tell you about Dr. Abram Petkow, and I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. In 1972, Dr. Abram Petkow discovered that low levels of radiation over a longer period of time were more damaging than higher doses over a short period of time. Once you ingest or inhale even very low levels of radioactive particles, the pet cow effect immediately starts potentially lethal tissue ionization. The phenomena of the pet cow effect basically means that you are ionizing or irradiating yourself continuously from the inside out, the particles inside of you. The insidious burning at your molecular level will impair your body long before there is a diagnosable disease. And then it lists some of the particular elements and where they may collect inside of your body. And that pretty much ends this presentation. You know, if anything, I would point you to a couple of the last screen caps we looked at. These projections out to 2031 of 1.3 million conservative. Again, I would say very conservative estimates. And the next particular uh, screen captures the thyroid cancer incidence where you see it's 10 years out maybe more before these effects really kick in but certainly after five years we're going to begin to see numbers really rise more than they are now it's going to be staggering so we want to get these numbers out we want to talk about this we want to remix we want to share and again i want to thank kevin blanche for all of his work and this was what prompted me to jump into this i've you know this is on my list of things to do trust me but right now he's absolutely right this is critical when i throw that number 75,000 out there you need to know where this number is coming from and i've linked to this and done some 
broadcast, but this is going to be the one where I put everything together, follow the links, look into it yourself, and like I say, talk to your friends, talk to your family, knock on your neighbor's doors that you don't even know, and talk to them, folks, because we're all in the same boat, and it's going to be the same conclusion. That's to decommission and shut down and dry cask all the spent fuel, and we have to go to solar, we have to go to wind. Germany is now leading the way in that now. No more nuclear. They have dates to they've set to shut their plants down, and they've already just blowing up on solar power over in Germany. It's amazing. It's really quite incredible, actually. Okay, folks, this is Patrick Penry, and I do thank you very much for joining me, and I thank you very much for spreading the word about our nuclear crisis. Over and out.